everyone, welcome back to the studio. Um, what a rock and roll lifestyle I lead. I've just spent the last hour or so doing the food shopping for the week and cleaning the kitchen. So I thought before I start actually doing some work properly today, I'd give you a little insight into the way I approach upcoming builds, especially those that are a little bit more vintage in nature. So, um, so I thought I'd do that. It's only gonna be a few minutes, but it'll give you a fair idea of where my inspiration comes from and how I go about choosing new projects and formulating a plan for their completion and their painting and that kind of thing. So I hope you find this interesting. It's, um, it's just a little bit of fun really. It's just me having a coffee and chatting away for the next 10 minutes. So I hope you find this enjoyable. Let's get started, shall we? So here we are. This is the kind of inspiration that I draw from. This is a 1973 edition of Scale Models. This is the November edition. And as you can see, this particular title draws heavily on the back then newly released Revell 32nd Scale Harrier. There are two on the cover. There's, a, there's an RAF one here and there's a United States Marine Corps one here. Now, this I first bought this magazine from an era jumble in, at, uh, I think it was the Yeovilton Museum long long time ago and mine was rather dog-eared so I got a replacement copy this one I bought off eBay for for a few pounds not that long ago and the reason for that is because this is a really in-depth look at what was a brand new kit at the time so this is the kind of thing that I do I tend to grab these old magazines I, I know it's not always the kind of thing that people enjoy doing and there's that sort of mentality that these older magazines tend to be dated and we all sort of move on and, and do other things. But I like them. I, I, I've collected a lot of these. And in fact, my good friend Alan Furbank has recently said that he's got a complete bound set of scale models, I think almost from issue one all the way through to the end of its life. So I will have a complete set of these, which is absolutely fantastic. He gave me three of the bound copies at the weekend and they're just amazing. So very exciting. For people who don't know about this magazine, this is a, a, a UK magazine and it was it was pretty much the, the, the benchmark in terms of quality back through the, the 70s and into the early part of the 80s. It lost its way after about 85, 86 when Ray Rimmel decided to, to move on to, to do other things and, and ended up doing Windsor. But back then it was it was pretty spectacular. So anyway, aside from all of the glowing review of this uh, of this magazine. So if we sort of flick through it, one of the things that you that you do notice in this is the huge amount of advertising you can kind of see, just adverts, 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 adverts. So, but that's not what we're interested in. What we're interested in is this feature here. This is the 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 build feature for um, for the 32nd scale Harrier and done by Pat Lloyd who was a very well known name back in the 70s he built a lot of models for, for scale models now the reason I'm showing you this is because I've already built one of these kits and I've got about four of them kicking around I've already built one I built it as a, a development batch Harrier in an essentially natural metal and, and kind of anodized finish that, that those aircraft were shown in but I like the idea of building another now the kit is a pretty much a hybrid. It's it's not quite a Harrier GR Mark One, but it's not quite a prototype either. It's a little bit somewhere in, in between and has features of both. So I was reading through this magazine a few days ago and it, it got the juices flowing a little bit. And I thought, well, maybe I should build another one of these Harrier kits but use this article as my as my template for it. Now I could go out of my way and pretty much rebuild this model add all sorts of details to it accurize it and that kind of thing but i think that would perhaps go against the spirit of it and plus i don't have an awful lot of time to be able to do these um these sort of in-depth builds i don't want this to be another t2 conversion that takes up 400 odd hours and over six months i, I want this to be a sort of a relatively speedy build now in here there is there's plenty of information for me to go at there's lots of drawings and um, lots of, of detailed information about the kit and how to get the best from it. So that's what I think I'm gonna do. I think I'm gonna look at building the kit, but maybe use this article as almost like a step-by-step -step guide. So I'm gonna put myself on the other side of, of, of the magazines that 
I guess, you guys read that have got my articles in. I'm going to go and be inspired by a magazine that was written and an article that was written by somebody else, if that makes any kind of sense, on a very blowy Wednesday morning. So you can see here that it's got a, a bunch of information across this double page spread as to how Pat Lloyd decided to rework the model. And part of those, part of part of the 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 the, the reworking is to change. You can see here on the side of the of the Harrier kit that Ravel made it had this separate fairing which was quite a distinctive feature of the of the prototypes and the early development aircraft whereas on the GR1 and then onto the GR3 this was all kind of blended in you can see the difference actually on the front cover if you look at this one here that hasn't been treated so you can see it there whereas on this one it has so just by doing that, I think that will give me something that's closer to an approximation of the of the Harrier. And then using some of his ideas here for copy detailing and, and reworking of certain areas. I, again, I think that will open up the possibilities of creating a 30 second scale model that, though not up to the standards of anything that you would create from a 21st century kit, will certainly pass muster when it's when it's sat on display or I take some photographs of it. So I think that would be really useful. And I, and also it would be, in, in many ways, it would be another legacy build. It will be me taking an older kit, adding some simple improvements to it without going overboard, and then creating something that I think will, will look good once finished. With these drawings in here as well, it gives me plenty of ideas should I want to add different panel lines and deal with all of those kind of things. Anybody that's built this, this Reval Harrier kit will know that it is, it's a fairly basic offering, but what it is, is bang on accurate. It's really accurate. Despite the compromises in, in detail that you'll find inside the box, the actual kit is really accurate. It was based on, on, on drawings that were gained from the manufacturer back in the day. So I don't have a problem with the idea of it not looking like a Harrier. You can see just by looking at those two pictures of the completed model that that's exactly how it looks. It's, it, it, it is a really nice model when it's done. And the DB Harrier that I created perfectly captured what I was, what I was aiming to achieve both in terms of its accuracy and also the finish and the detail. This one I think would be a much simpler model to create. So I like the idea of it. I really, I really think that this could be something that maybe people will see. Also, because Ravel have reissued this kit recently with new decals, you're able to perhaps, or rather I'm able to perhaps, take this one step further and use Pat Lloyd's template on these two pages in terms of detailing and improving the Ravel 30 second scale Harrier, but then I could maybe convert it and do a GR3 from it. So that would give me something that would step away from this slightly and give me another avenue to explore in terms of the the new nose and also modifications to the fin and rear tail boom. So that might be something else that I could do. But there's plenty of information in here. And not only is there information in here about the 30 second scale kit, one of the great things about this issue as well, if we sort of move through, here we go, look at this. What is photo etching? shows you how uh, things have moved on. In 1973, they were explaining what photo etching is and, and how you create your own photo etch parts. Whereas now it's just, it's just so much part of what we do. So I think it's back here somewhere. There we go. So he also spends time in here away from the 30 second scale kit to convert the Airfix 70 second scale offering using an air model conversion kit. And you can see here the, the two, two seaters that he's created. They look really good, I have to say. They, they really do look nice. 
yeah, the photographs are, you know, we've obviously we're working from black and white photographs, so it's difficult to sort of tell how the how the models would have looked in, in reality. We're so used to having high resolution, high definition images these days, but back then this is what we used. And also I love this, that he used the Airfix kit stand to create the fairings behind the behind the cockpit. So good, so imaginative. That's the that's what I love about these old magazines that that they were working with what they had, working with the kits they had, working with the products and working with the tools and techniques that were to hand at the time. So that's what I'm planning. I'm planning on doing something with this, with this old Ravel Harrier kit once again. And I'm, I'm gonna just have a go at, at, at seeing what I can create using, using Pat's article from 1973. This is a, a 50 year old, over 50 year old magazine, but I think it's gonna offer me plenty of inspiration. So that's where I, where I tend to start with these things. I pick up an old magazine and if I'm dealing with an old kit, I read what the authors back then thought of the kit because their information, the way that they looked at the kit is no different to the way that we look at kits now. They weren't any less informed and in some ways, I think they were, they spent more time dealing with the, the references for those kits because they had so little to go on. They couldn't just drop onto the internet, couldn't just drop onto Wikipedia um, and find photographs and information. So, so that I think is a very good start. There's definitely things I can improve on, on what Pat created for his model. But I think at the end of the process, with a little bit of work, I could come up with something that may be interesting for me as a project and hopefully interesting for people who read about it, whether or not that's in magazines or online. So I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you've, you've enjoyed this little tiny insight into the way my mind works and how my preparation begins for, for a build of an older kit. And that it gives you some inspiration should you wish to have a go at something similar. So thanks for watching this. Thanks once again for, for tuning in to all of the other videos. If you like this video, please comment on it, click a like or subscribe to my channel. It really would help me out. And in the meantime, have a great day and I'll see you again soon. Thanks a lot. Bye for now.